So, uh, thanks for coming back. Uh, this is, we're moving on to the fourth lecture. So we had the first two lectures, which are some introductions to electromagnetism, special relativity, and quantum mechanics. And now we're going to be about halfway through all the, the, the bit about particle physics. And after we talk about particle physics, then the rest of the time will be on gravity, quantum gravity, and string theory, which is really getting into really needy stuff. Um, but we need to spend some more time on particle physics. And so today's lecture, I'm going to talk about the standard model and beyond. And as I started thinking about how much I had to say about the standard model, I realized that some of this beyond is going to have to go over here because there's a lot left to say about the standard model. Um, and I still have to, I still have to, um, I owe you some slides about the Higgs and the experimental search for the Higgs. Um, I decided since the LHC is a proton-photon machine, and really talking about the LHC properly requires talking about quarks and gluons and things like that. I'm going to take those slides about the experimental search for the Higgs, and I put them closer to the end today. So they're not right at the beginning, but I will make sure I get to them. So in the first two lectures, we've already encountered roughly two-thirds of the standard model. In lecture two, I introduced a little bit quantum electrodynamics which is the quantum theory that describes electromagnetism. And in the last lecture, we talked about, well, the last lecture was about the Higgs boson, but if you're going to talk about the Higgs boson, you're really talking about the weak interactions, radioactive decay. So the last lecture, we met the weak interactions. And I wanted to summarize, because there was a lot of information there, I wanted to summarize a few basic concepts from the last lecture. And the main concept I want to summarize is this idea of uh, forces between particles um, being mediated by a particle exchange. So, you can, in, at the level of particle physics, we think of the elect two electrons interacting by the electromagnetic force as the exchange of a uh, photon, one of these quantum electromagnetism. And the nice thing about quantum electromagnetism is it's something we experience in our daily lives, so we can try to give some kind of uh, macroscopic uh, version of what's going on here. So you can think we have an, ele have an electron just you know, sitting here in a trap, maybe. Another electron comes along, and as the second electron comes along, it's changing the electromagnetic field. You know, it, it, it's sourcing the electromagnetic field as it moves along, and the first electron feels the change in that electromagnetic field. Well, the change in that electromagnetic field has to be communicated in some way. It's communicated as the fact that you know, as, as the first electron moves in, there's some almost tidal, you can think of them as like waves, you know, um, uh, uh, changes of the electromagnetic field that propagate away. And well, those macroscopic waves that characterize how the electron coming in changes the electromagnetic field felt by the other electron. Uh, those electromagnetic waves are just coherent sums of photons. So we can think of uh, this as just a sort of microscopic description of what happens when an electron comes in uh, changing the local electromagnetic field that we see. As it comes in, it changes the electromagnetic field that we see. It transmits information about that electron is being transmitted in the electromagnetic waves. And those electromagnetic waves are just coherent sums of photons. Now, the reason that we can see electromagnetic, electromagnetic force at large distances is because the force carrier, the photon, is massless. So I could put, it moves at the speed of light, and it doesn't decay. So I could have this electron here, or I could have it way up here. Even if it's way up here, a photon can still get up there and mediate a force between them. Um, the other way that we know that it's a long-range force is because the strength of the electromagnetic interaction is just a number. In these natural units that we use, where Planck's constant and the speed of light are set to one, it's just a number. There's no characteristic scale that tells us what that, that characterizes the interaction. So it's an interaction that's felt at all scales. The weak interaction is very similar to electromagnetism. Um, well, we started thinking about it in terms of this uh, Fermi theory. We noticed that this Fermi theory had a characteristic energy scale to it. The strength of the interaction, where a neutron decays into a proton and other stuff, came with an energy scale that told us that, well, it does matter whether you're doing this in long distances or short distances. And we saw last time that this description is not really the right one. The right description is something like this. There's a force carrier particle just like the photon, the W or Z. It's just like the photon in every way, except it's massive. It's heavy, and that means that it, uh, it was heavy, and it, it decays in some short lifetime. So if I have a neutron coming in, and I have some neutron, well, a neutron coming in and some neutrino, this Z boson that's going to mediate the decay, it, uh, it has a short lifetime. So if the neutrino is way down here, the Z boson can't get down there to mediate the interaction. It will decay first. 
So in this sense, you can think of the mass scale of the Z boson, or equivalently the, uh, the, 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 the lifetime of the Z boson sort of setting the distance scale over which the interaction is felt. So the weak interaction is a short range interaction because there's a characteristic scale. And the scale of the, you know, the characteristic scale is set by the mass of the W and the Z bosons. But other than that, the two things are very similar. There's a, you know, the particles come together and they interact with each other through the exchange of the intermediate, uh, intermediate uh, force carrying particle. Good. So this is just a summary of what I had before. Uh, you know, I really want to make sure I nailed this point home. Folk, the quantum electrodynamics has a photon, a massless force carrier. It's a long-range force that's mediated through this exchange. The weak nuclear force is mediated by weak bosons. They're massive force carriers. It's a short-range force whose range is set by the mass of the particles. And it's also mediated by this kind of decay. So this is part of the standard model. And I had to block out some of it because we haven't met all of it. There's the force carrier electromagnetism, the weak interactions. And then we've also met the leptons, which are the matter fields that couple to these things. It includes the electron, the neutrino, and some other stuff, some more, you know, so two massive partners of the electron and corresponding neutrinos. So there's actually three generations of leptons. And one of the great mysteries in particle physics is why there are three, and we have no answer for that. And string theory doesn't provide an answer for that that I know of either at the moment. So this is two-thirds of the standard model, and, well, it's not the full standard model, but why not? And this is where I tell you about the greatest embarrassment of, of of uh, junior high school for me, well, there's many embarrassing junior high school, right? It's a weird time. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, this is one that I actually remember. Because in seventh grade, we were learning about atomic physics. And I remember our teacher's name was Mr. Luz. And he's telling us about, you know, okay, atoms have a nucleus, it's made of protons and neutrons. And he said, okay, the nucleus of an atom is made up of a bunch of positively charged protons. And I didn't raise my hand and say, why didn't the protons repel each other? You know, positively charged particles repel under electromagnetism. As soon as you're done learning that positively charged particles repel each other, the next thing they tell you is that, well, the nucleus is made up of a bunch of positively charged protons stacked together. Your first question should be, why don't they repel each other? What's going on? And, well, stupid me, I didn't even think to ask that question. It was a great embarrassment. I probably should have thought of that. So, um, what, so that, that's a really good question. You know, what, that, what keeps the protons together in the nucleus of an atom? And it tells us that our model of physics is, is, is still missing a force. We managed to describe radioactive decay, but we haven't explained this. And uh, that force was introduced by Hideki Yukawa, who supposed that protons and neutrons interact by, well, how are you going to describe this force? The same way we describe the weak interactions in electromagnetism, there must be some particle that exchange, a particle exchange between protons and neutrons that mediates this force. So he introduced a force carrier particle. He didn't call it a pion. There's a complicated history here because he called it a muon, and then they discovered the muon, but then they realized the muon wasn't this particle, it was something else, so the particle that does it. Long convoluted history, the, the moral of the story is that if you read particle physics papers from back in the 50s, the names of particles that you see there are not necessarily the things that uh, we know them as today. So, uh, but there's a, there's a, he suggested that it was mediated by a particle exchange. And this pion is just like the W and Z bosons, it's massive, so this force is short range. And it decays. It decays pretty rapidly. Its lifetime is 10 to minus 17 seconds. So you can ask, how, how could you observe such a particle? And I will tell you that this particle, and you know, this particle was discovered, I think, in the late 60s, which was well before the W and Cs were discovered. You can imagine how how did people manage to discover a particle that that, that, that that's so short-lived? And the answer is they took it. This was the era before particle accelerators, and they took advantage of the fact that nature gives us a natural particle accelerator in some sense. Nature gives us this wonderful thing called cosmic rays. You know, the Earth is constantly being bombarded by particles from outer space at very high energies, and a particle can come in from outer space and interact with stuff in the atmosphere and have some shower of decay. And this is essentially what we do with particle accelerators. It's a very high energy particle that just decays. I should say, if you read anywhere in the popular press about the LHC possibly creating small black holes and destroying the Earth, and et cetera, et cetera, regardless of whether you think your quantum theory of gravity predicts small black holes, physicists were pretty sure the LHC wasn't going to destroy the Earth because these collisions have been happening since the Earth's been around, and these collisions are of much higher energies than the LHC could ever hope to achieve. So, 
if the Earth was going to be destroyed by small black holes made in high energy collisions, then cosmic rays would have done that a long time ago and we wouldn't be here. But anyway, what people were, what people were able to do in order to look at the, in, in order to study these processes in cosmic rays, is they took these sort of special metallic plates that charged particles would leave tracks on. This is something I don't know that much about, but they would, and they would put these, these plates at high altitudes, either on some mountains or fly them up in balloons, and they'd be able to produce tracks like this. And actually, I guess you can't read the labels, which is good, because these are all old labels, and they don't make any, you know, they're not properly labeled. Like, this is called a tau, but this is not a tau on it's something, what we call a tau on it's something else. Um, but this won Cecil Frank Powell Nobel Prize, um, and these techniques were used to discover the pion back in the 60s. Um, now we uh, now we don't do that. We use particles. Actually, I shouldn't say that. People still do a lot of work studying cosmic rays and, uh, and, uh, and uh, looking for new particles that way. But we also have particle accelerators. And here's a picture of the one over not far from here in India. Um, and the nice thing about these is you can you can collide. You can control where the collision happens. You know, you accelerate the particles, you bring them together at a particular point, and then you can build a giant detector apparatus around it. These detectors are enormous. I'll have more pictures of them later. Uh, and so this allowed people to really, by colliding these far, you know, colliding particles together, this is actually, I use this for the LHC. The LHC is a DT machine, it is not, it's a DT bar machine. Um, uh, by colliding all these particles and making all this stuff, you can discover many, many, many things. And in this way, you can also rediscover the pion and things like that. Now, why am I talking about all these particle accelerators and looking for pions? Now, the pion mediates this strong nuclear force. And, well, people looked around for new particles, and they found the pion, but they found a whole bunch of other stuff, too. And I decided, this is, this I took from the particle data group. This is a summary of what we know. Well, I shouldn't say we, because I don't know any of this. This is a summary of what, what people know about mesons, which is just a particular type a particle that participates in the strong interactions. In, in the 1960s, when people were discovered, you know, started turning on these particle accelerators and discovering pions and all that, um, they discovered not just pions, but an entire zoo of particles. It literally is known as the particle zoo. In fact, the particle zoo has its own entry on Wikipedia. If you uh, talk to people who were around at that time, you know, we have a couple of people in our group that were around in that time, they tell you that new particles are being discovered every week. Uh, and so it's just a huge mess. And how do you make sense of this? Does nature really have this many fundamental particles? So in order to try to make sense of this mess, people introduced many concepts. Uh, they introduced uh, a lot of ideas and symmetries to explain the decay patterns and masses of all this crazy stuff to bring some order to this table. And they introduced concepts like isospin. Um, there's one that was called strangeness. OK. Uh, it's very creative in name. One that was called charm. And the way these worked, um, you would, strangeness is kind of like a number that you would assign to every particle. And if a particle with strangeness 3, or minus 3, say, decays, then <coughs> some of the strangeness of all the particles in the decay products would also be minus 3. And so they'd say, OK, there must be some conserved quantity here. But nobody really knew what that conserved quantity was. So uh, you may have seen pictures like this in Helia's talks from a couple of years ago. I'm going to repeat them. Uh, if you take some of these particles they, and, and plot them in the right way, they make some pretty interesting patterns. So I'll focus on, on, on this for a minute. Here's the neutron and the proton. And then there's a bunch of particles called sigmas and lambdas and these cascade particles. Um, and what motivates these groupings is, is you notice that these eight particles all have, within some rough sense, roughly the same mass. And then here's 10 particles that also have roughly the same mass and eight particles that have roughly the same mass. So even though you have this huge zoo of particles, you can break, break them up into groups that are sort of similar. They have roughly the same mass. And plot them in this funny way. Now, they're plotted in such a way that the particles on the same horizontal line carry the same strangeness. So this odd quantum number we introduced is ad hoc. These all carry the same strangeness, and these carry the same strangeness. And uh, on the diagonal lines, the particles carry the same charge. Now you might say it's a little weird to plot things like this. Usually we plot we would plot strangeness horizontally and charge vertically or something. Why is charge tilted? Well, it's partly to make these nice uh, nice hexagons look. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little more appealing, slightly more visually appealing if it's rotated. 
But it's also because these diagrams, if you talk to mathematicians who study symmetry structure, these diagrams have an intrinsic meaning to them. A mathematician will look at these pictures and immediately say, oh, this is SU3, which is some kind of symmetry structure. And uh, this is just sort of a canonical, a canonical mathematical way of visualizing these diagrams. So there's actually a lot of structure to the fact these look like ad hoc, ad hoc pictures in some sense, but there's a lot of structure to the fact that the particles of the same mass can be organized in this symmetric way. This, and this structure is actually one of the things that I found really interesting when I was first getting into physics and, and really made me interested in high energy physics was this underlying symmetry structure, um, which I really liked a lot. Uh, and these numbers, by the way, also, they're, they're a hint, the numbers, 10, 8, 8, and 1. They're a hint of some underlying structure. So, what I wanted to do was spend about five or ten minutes to give a flavor of what this underlying symmetry structure is. I'm not going to tell the whole story, and, I'm, and there are probably people in the audience who know the whole story, but I apologize, I apologize to you guys. Um, I'm not going to tell the whole story. I'm not even going to tell a uh, significant chunk of the whole story, but I want to give a flavor for, um, for uh, what's going on and for why, why these sort of numbers are, are so special. So, this underlying structure is related to the mathematics of symmetry. And in order to make clear that I'm just talking about math right now and not physics, I'm, I'm going to talk in terms of some weird math thing, which is just talk in terms of some ice cream instead of particles. So, I'm, I'm going to suppose there are three, you know, we go to an ice cream shop, it's not 31 flavors, they're kind of cheap, they only have three. Uh, I looked all over the place for an ice cream flavor that was reasonable that started with you, and I couldn't find it. <laughs> I, I, I'm serious. I looked at Wikipedia. There's a Wikipedia entry. List of ice cream flavors. And all the tea. Boom. You. Nothing. All the tea. It's great. So, so I'm just going to call it fun. So we have three, three, three flavors of ice cream, and everybody knows where the Indian are coming from. And we decided to go buy a couple of sundaes, but we let the guy behind the counter choose uh, what flavors we get at random. And if he does that, we can ask ourselves how many possibilities uh, uh, for our sundaes can we have. Well, for my sunday, I have three choices, and for your Sunday, there's three possibilities. So there's a total of nine possibilities that can come out if we try to choose two Sundays from three flavors. Now, now let's suppose, I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of a little selfish and kind of okay, so let's suppose I, I don't bring you along, I just you know, go myself. <laughs> now, why, why am I going to treat you to ice cream when I can just buy two Sundays? <laughs> So, so I'm going to buy two Sundays and I'm going to eat them both. Now, if I buy two Sundays and they're both for me, then I don't really, you know, these two choices are different. You know, if the first one's a fudge and the second one's a cookie dough, or the first one's a cookie dough and the second one's a fudge, it's all the same to me because I have one fudge and one cookie dough. So if I count this way, this way meaning that I don't care about the ordering, uh, I don't care about the, the order of the choices, just the number of U's and the number of D's, there's less than nine distinct combinations. There's fewer. And in fact, you can enumerate all the possibilities. There's six of them. Uh, there's six possibilities. They could either both be fudge, they could both be cookie dough, they could both be strawberry, or you have these symmetric combinations. I put the plus here to mean that I, I don't distinguish between UD and DU. They're the same to me. If the first one is uh, fudge or cookie dough, or the second first one is cookie dough or fudge, then you know, it doesn't matter. So I group them together into one, into one combination. So there's, there's only six uh, different combinations, uh, as opposed to nine. So this is just a you know, this is just a mathematics associated to choosing Sundays and from flavor from flavors of ice cream. Now mathematicians like to do something with these counting problems. They like to take these nine total combinations and divide them into groups that don't mix under relabeling. And we already found one of those groups. When I just chose the Sundays for myself, we found one of those groups. If I change the labels of U and D, then well. If I suppose I interchange U and D, then, then this becomes DD, which is here. This becomes UU, which is here. This goes into itself. It becomes UD plus DU, and these two flip each other. But any, any interchange of the labels of the ice cream, these six combinations mix amongst themselves. They don't mix with these three. And then these three mix amongst themselves up to a minus sign. They don't mix with these. So mathematicians will write an equation. And the equation they will write is 6 plus 3 equals 9. And if you walk into a physicist's, board, physicist's office or mathematician's office and you see this equation on the board, you think, you know, why are we paying this idiot to do physics? He's just, you know, doing you know, kindergarten adding. Six plus three equals nine. But there's actually a meaning to this. The meaning is that of the nine ways to choose, 
two objects from three, or choose two objects from three flavors, uh, there's six of them that don't mix under interchange, and another group of three that don't mix under interchange. <coughs> so, if we have a set of states made of two things that come in three flavors, we expect a natural grouping where there are six that are sort of similar, and there are a different set of three that are sort of similar. Now, in the particle zoo, we didn't see sixes and threes. We saw tens, eights, and ones. But now I'm going to do some more elementary math. I grew on here in, 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 on purpose a group of ten, two groups of eight, and a group of one. And now I'm going to trivially add those together to get 27. And I'm going to say 27 is a cool number. It's three times three times three. So, uh, and three times three times three is just uh, if, if, if we invite somebody else to come along and now. You know, why am I why asking for three people? But okay. If we, we invite somebody else to come along, how many combinations can we have and we can have 27? And, well, if, if you do the same exercise we just did for choosing two Sundays with three flavors, for choosing three Sundays out of three flavors, this 6 plus 3 is replaced by 10 plus 8 plus 8 plus 1. This, the 10 symmetric combinations, or at least 10, this is what we would have, you know, this is the analog of the 6 we saw before. And here's a 1. If we interchange U, D, and S, these are all going to be symmetric under interchange. This guy just goes into itself, so there's a 1. And then the eights are a little more tricky to understand. So mathematicians, so when, when mathematicians look at this grouping, they say, aha, the part of all these particles, if they group naturally in these groups of 10, 8, and 1, these particles display a pattern that's consistent with each one being made of three things that come in three flavors. OK, it's just math. I haven't done any physics or anything. We've just organized the particles according to similar masses, looked for structure, and noticed that this nice, nice structure of uh, permutation groups is sitting there. <coughs> the particles look like you know, they organize themselves into natural groups that are consistent with being made of three things that come in three flavors. And well, this is this observation ended up winning Murray Goman the Nobel Prize because he suggested, okay, let's let's introduce if, if it looks like it's made of three things that come in three flavors, let's give a name to the things. He called them quarks, which comes from a James Joyce novel, and I'm blanking on which one, probably somebody knows. Uh, Murray was really great at giving creative names. Uh, Murray's, most of Murray's thoughts were about this group of eight particles that included the proton and the neutron, so he called this the eightfold way after the uh, Buddhist path to enlightenment. <laughs> and it is very enlightening. So, it's Finnegan's way. Pardon? It's Finnegan's way. Oh, Finnegan's way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I couldn't remember which one of them. Uh, yeah, so, 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 um, so each of these particles is composed of, so he said, let's suppose that each of these particles is really composed of three quarks, and that the three, three flavors of quark, he called them up, down, and strange, and strange is, because, well, we had this idea of strangeness, and strangeness is now really just counting the number of strange quarks. And this was a very useful organizing principle that gave order to the zoo of particles that were seen. Now, I've, I've intentionally introduced this in, in, a, in a sort of backwards way based on symmetry structure to make clear that when Murray made this proposal, um, he wasn't necessarily saying that quarks were real. He was just saying that, you could, that, that the symmetry structure was as though all of these particles were made up of quarks. And people didn't really know if quarks were real or not. There was, there was a real question, oh, I forgot about this slide. Ugh. Yeah, this is, this is actually why Gohmann won the Nobel Prize, because in the group of 10, only nine of the particles had actually been seen. So he used the symmetry structure to predict the 10th and actually predict its mass. So the, a great, great use of symmetry in order to, 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 to make predictions. But as I was saying, quarks were introduced as a mathematical tool that was suggested by symmetry structure and mass patterns. But you can ask the question, were quarks real? And, uh, well, I don't think people, the people were not, uh, you know, people were wondering about this. And that begs the question of if quarks are real, how would you tell? How can you tell, you know, if, 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 if quarks are real or equivalently, how can I tell if my favorite particle is a fundamental particle or a composite particle? And well, how do we study particles in general? The only way you can study a particle is you have a particle sitting here, but not really it's sitting there, but there's a particle sitting here and you fire stuff at it and look at what happens. You do a scattering experiment. So, we study electrons, for example, by taking other electrons and shooting them in and scattering them off the original electrons. And one of the things that you can observe if you scatter electrons off of each other is that energy appears to be conserved. If I look at the energy of the incoming electrons and the energy of the electrons after the, after the event, after the scattering event, that energy is the same. 
And the word we use for that, we say the scattering is elastic. Um, in the case of, uh, say, a proton, you can do the same kind of experiment. That if you scatter an electron off a proton, you'll look, you'll look at the energy, initial energy of the electron and the proton, look at the final energy of the electron and the proton, and it will look to you like energy is not conserved. We call that inelastic, and the fact that energy conservation is violated is the indication that the proton is composite. Well, why is that? Energy is never really violated. Ener energy conservation is never really violated. Energy is always conserved. But what happens in this process is some of the energy from the electron gets deposited in the internal structure of the proton. Because the proton is made of stuff, you know, the, the energy of the proton, when the electron comes in, it can give some kinetic energy to the proton, making it move, but it can also give some essentially vibrational energy that makes these individual constituents move back and forth and move around. When we measure the energies of the particles at the end of the scattering experiment, we can see the kinetic energy of the proton, but we don't know about this extra in, you know, motion, uh, particles moving around and bumping, you know, bumping around inside the proton. So to us, it looks like this energy is lost. It's really there. It's just been deposited in the internal structure of the proton. So the way to tell that a proton is composite is to do one of these scattering experiments and see if energy is conserved or not. If energy is lost, then that energy has really been deposited in the internal structure of the proton. And I found this nice plot on the, on the uh, physics website. Um, this just gives an idea. The vertical axis you can think of as, as something like probability. And the horizontal axis is the, the uh, electron energy, essentially. And in low electron energies, the, the scattering is mostly, on the, if you look at how many scattering events conserve energy, and which ones don't, it's almost probability one, you have energy conservation. But at higher energies, almost none of the interactions are conserving energy. Um, the proton or the electron is actually shooting through all this gunk in, in the proton, all this gunk of quarks and so on. And uh, that makes the, the, a lot of energy gets deposited here, and that makes the scattering process inelastic instead of elastic. So, um, so the proton and neutron are not alone. All of the particles of this particle zoo are quark bound states. And they come in two different kinds. There are the baryons, which are made of triples of quarks, and then there are the mesons, which are quark anti quark pairs. I didn't say anything about, you know, I was always talking about groups of three. This is a sense in which an anti quark is mathematically the same as two quarks, which is how I did that. Um, and I won't talk about that. So there's the baryons, which are triples of quarks, and the mesons, which are quark uh, anti quark bound states. So, we see all these things, and by the way, this explains a little bit why we see a zoo of particles. If you have a composite particle like this, um, you can add energy to it. You, know, you can have excitation energy, whereas these quarks carry, uh, you know, just like you can excite the energy levels of an atom, you can excite the energy levels of a, of a bound state of, quark, of a quark, bound state of quarks, and every one of those excited states will look to us like a new particle. So once you have this composite nature, you have this sort of looks like a zoo of particles. But the quark idea tells us that no, the number of fundamental particles isn't out of control. It's just a few, just a few quarks, and we just need to understand the physics of those quarks. Do those particles release their energy? Um, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll, we'll get to that. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. So um, there are no free quarks. We don't see the actual quarks themselves. And you can ask the question, why don't we, do, why don't we see quarks? And, well, in order to explain that, we need to understand the physics of quarks. And in fact, we're only going to believe, if, if believe our model of physics for quarks if we don't see free quarks. So the question is, can we develop a theory to describe the physics of quarks and the physics of these things? Now, as a self-respecting string theorist, I, I have to have a slide here about string theory, because this is where string theory got started. You probably have heard this before, um, but I will, I will repeat it again. Um, string theory was originally conceived in order to try to explain the strong nuclear interaction and in order to understand the physics of these mesons, baryons, and ultimately quarks. And the idea was, well, I, I drew this, the, the, this bound state as kind of like a spring, you know, two ends, so it looks kind of like a string. And I did that on purpose because in many ways it is. And people thought that a decent, a good way to describe the mesons early on was as a string. Think of this uh, pair of particles just as a string for the charges at the end. And indeed, if you look at the spectrum of mesons, the masses of mesons, they, they, they exhibit some features that are consistent with uh, this sort of string description. 
So in the 1960s, people started studying the quantum mechanics of, or the quantum behavior of strings precisely in order to describe these mesons. Now, they ran into some problems. And one of the problems they ran into was that uh, it predicted massless particles of spin 2. And massless particles, there, all, all the, all the, none of the mesons and baryons have, you know, there are no massless particles of spin 2 there. And, well, one of the things that's nice about massless particles of spin 2, people realized, is they generate a gravitational field. And this is when people started thinking, oh, maybe quantum theory of strings should be describing gravity, not the strong interactions, and then it moved on from there. In the last 10 years, there's been a lot of excitement in the sense that, well, maybe 15, in this gauge gravity duality, that there is a sense in which strings really do describe mesons in a sense, but it's much more involved. It's this ADS-CFT correspondence, which I don't think I'm going to have time to fit into the lectures, but I'm happy to, to, to chat with people about it. So this is where string theory got its start, but it had a problem. And this problem turned into a nice feature that is going to be very important for us later, but we'll come back to it. So strings didn't work, so we still need a theory of physics to describe the physics of quarks. Well, if I'm going to want to talk about the new particle, and those particles are going to have a, a force between them, I should do the same thing that I did with electromagnetism with the weak interactions. I have a particle. I want it to interact with another particle. There should be a force carrier. Some, you know, some excitation to exchange in order to mediate the force. So we introduce a force carrier particle, and that force carrier is called the gluon because it glues the quarks together. And uh, this is a very creative, you know, not everybody is as creative as a bird go on with quarks. <laughs> so um, it's called the gluon. And uh, well, the quarks should carry some charge. And in fact, quarks carry an odd kind of charge. Some of the baryons have three identical quarks in them. The omega minus has three strange quarks, for example. And the Pauli exclusion principle requires, uh, or doesn't allow us to have three particles in the same quantum state. So it suggests, this is a roundabout argument of something that really is some better math for. Um, it suggests that this, that this fact suggests that there should be three different kinds of charge. So in electromagnetism, there's positive and negative charge, but uh, the force mediated by gluons, these particles don't carry plus or minus, they carry a, a sort of color charge, blue, red, or green. And this leads to something very important, and that is that, well, if quarks can be blue, red, or green, there has to be a gluon that connects a red and a green quark, there has to be a different gluon that connects a red and a blue quark, and so on. So in fact, there are eight types of gluon. Um, you might think there was nine, but there's actually only eight. Um, there's one combination that's not really there. So the idea is to model the strong nuclear force between quarks by analogy with electromagnetism and weak interactions through this gluon exchange, and because we call the charge a color, blue, green, or red, the theory goes by the name of quantum chromodynamics. The, that should probably be in some, uh, some rainbow colors. <laughs> and then the question you can ask is, can this model explain why we don't see any free quarks? You, you can, you're free to say that quarks interact by exchange of gluons, and that's great. Uh, but if this, doesn't, if this doesn't explain why all the quarks show up in bound states and not free in, the, free in nature, then nobody's going to believe this model is worth anything. Uh, and this is a very important thing you probably may have heard about recently because it was the, related to the 2004 Nobel Prize. So the key point, which is going to tell us why quarks are able to, or why the strong nuclear interactions are able to describe uh, quark interchange, is the fact that the strong force behaves differently at different, at different energy and distance scales. So before getting to that, let me give you an example of electromagnetism and tell you how electromagnetism behaves. So we saw before the electromagnetic interaction between a photon and an electron um, comes by this ball. Well, it's, it's a local interaction. The electron comes along, photon comes along, and they have some coupling structure. And oh, I'm missing a vertical line here. I apologize. Um, and this, uh, this, this interaction receives many quantum corrections. It receives a quantum correction where uh, Electron and photon are created, it receives this kind of quantum correction and many others, and we've said you have to sum over all of these quantum corrections. These quantum corrections, they change the way that the, the, the interaction strength uh, happens. And they actually cause the strength of the electromagnetic interaction to depend on the distance scale which we measure. So here's a little cartoon of that. If I have an electron sitting here generating an electromagnetic field, we know that in quantum mechanics, particles and antiparticles can pop in and out of existence all the time. So in particular, electron-positron pairs can just pop right out of the vacuum. Well, as soon as an electron-positron pair pops out of the vacuum, they're going to align themselves like this. They're going to align themselves like this because, well, the electron here is going to attract the positron and repel the electron. 
So they're all going to rotate with the positrons on the inside and the electrons on the outside. But this has an effect of screening the charge that, 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 that's seen in the middle. If I have an electron sitting out here, it's not just going to see the charge of this electron, it's going to see all this other stuff. Um, it's going to see all this other stuff. And because the positrons are closer and the electrons are further out, it's going to see an effect of lower charge. Um, um, the electric frequency is going to be weaker. So the way you can think of this is that the vacuum reacts to the electric field of the electron by creating these, you know, it, it reacts in such a way as to screen some of the electron charge, to shield it from, from us farther away. And this effectively decreases the strength of the electromagnetic interaction that we feel out here. So the plot that we draw of this is we would say, here's energy scales, and here's the strength of the electromagnetic interaction. And we say at uh, large energy scales, which is short distances, very close to the electron, the strength is large. But at low energy scales, which is large distances, the strength of the interaction is very weak. It becomes weaker and weaker as we go to larger distance scales. This is why we can describe electromagnetism well in, in, in classical mechanics, because at very large distance scales, it's very weakly coupled. It's, uh, it's not, a very, not that strong, and so we can understand it in, in some, some reasonable way. Um, QCD has a similar behavior. Quarks interact with gluons, and then there's a bunch of quantum corrections. But one of those quantum corrections is something like this, which we don't have in electromagnetism. Because there are more than one gluon, in electromagnetism there's only one photon. But in QCD, because there's more than one gluon, different gluons can interact with each other. So we get a new interaction where the, the, the QCD field, the field of the strong nuclear force, self-interacts on itself. It's very different from QED. And it gives uh, fundamentally different behavior in how this force behaves at short and long distance scales. Um, and here's a little cartoon I found that shows a similar kind of screening effect happens. If a, if a red quark is sitting here, then you might create the red bar green to screen a little bit, and so all these particle antiparticle pairs come out. But because we're not talking about plus minus charges, it's not true that you have a bunch of plus charges in the inside that's canceling the minus charge. There's something more complicated going on um, that involves how these charges are all related to each other. And it's not obvious um, what effect the screening is going to have. And that's why when these people figured out what effect that screening was going to have, they eventually won a Nobel Prize for it. And what they found is that QCD, unlike the, the electromagnetism, QCD is very strong at large distances and weak at small distances. So you remember the QCD, the, QE, the electromagnetism plot, the coupling strength went up like this. This is, uh, and this is actually some data points, the coupling strength of Q, QCD, the strong interactions, goes down. At higher energy scales, it becomes weaker. In higher energies, we know, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, small distances. So before I talk about what this means, I'll say there's a neat story behind this. Um, David Pollitzer was uh, Sidney Coleman's graduate student. Sidney Coleman is the, uh, the, uh, the uh, professor at Harvard who had this famous uh, course on quantum field theory that I mentioned <coughs> in a couple of lectures ago. Uh, David Pollitzer was his graduate student, and this was a project that Sidney assigned to him. It's a great position to be in as a graduate student. You walk into graduate school, your advisor says, here's a calculation, go do it. You do the calculation, and then you win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of the dream. And if I, if I know my history correctly, Frank Wolchek was also a graduate student. He was the student of David Gross in Princeton. And the story as I've heard it is that David Pulitzer, so this low behavior depends on a sign. You, you do some calculation, and you get a sign, either positive or negative. If the sign is, is one way, then the force decreases with energy scale. If it's the other way, it increases with energy scale. And the whole trick to the calculation, which is a long and detailed calculation, is to get the sign right. And that's the worst thing in physics, because the sign is the easiest thing to mess up. And as I understand the story, David Pollitzer got the sign right, and these guys had the sign wrong. And what happened was Sidney, David's advisor, went to Princeton to get a talk about this. And these guys were in the audience of the talk, and Sidney mentioned David's results. And these guys, Sidney didn't know these guys were working on it, and these guys were like, oh, you know, that's, a, that's the opposite sign from what we found. And over the weekend, they went and looked at their calculation, they found the mistake, and very quickly put out the paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, this, this is more common. This is, this is how physics works, right? So um, uh, another cute story about this, um, this, I don't know if you know this, this television show about physicists at Caltech called The Big Bang Theory. And the main character in that, there's an episode where the main character in that show, by physicists love this show because a lot of the physics in it is real and very accurate. And the main character in this, this show, his name is Sheldon, he has a, some equations on his whiteboard one day. 
And a girl comes along, a female physicist, and corrects him and says, you know, the, the fixes the sign in one of these equations, says the sign is wrong. The equation on that board was actually the equation for this process, and the sign is the one that David Pollitzer got right, that these guys got wrong. <laughs> and, 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 and determines, and, and you know, this, this sign is the reason that, we, you know, that QCD behaves the way that it does, and it was responsible for this Nobel Prize. It's an extremely important calculation in the history of physics. So why does that explain that we don't see free quarks? Well, it's the statement that QCD is weak at small distances, but strong at large distances. So if we take a quark anti quark pair and we try to pull them apart, the further apart they get, the stronger the force gets. So it really behaves a lot like a spring, which is part of the reason that I drew this like a spring. It behaves very much like a spring, and as you pull it further and further apart, it takes even more energy to separate them. And at some point, in order to separate them, you put so much energy into the problem that there's enough energy to spontaneously create a new quark anti quark pair. And then they just bind to the old guys. So you find that when you've tried to separate the quarks away, you thought you were going to have two free quarks, but at the end of the day, you don't have that. You have two free mesons, in this case, two free pions. So separating quarks requires so much energy that we make a quark anti quark pair if we try to pull them apart. This is why we don't see free quarks anywhere, and this phenomenon is no called confinement. <coughs> so that's, that's the standard model. So we've covered basically everything in the standard model. There's the electromagnetic effect. And I tried in the handout, I tried to put a summary of sort of the important features of the standard model. Um, just because you know, it's nice to have a summary of something somewhere, I guess. So there's the electromagnetic interaction. Uh, the, the strong nuclear interaction is mediated by gluons. The weak nuclear force is mediated by Ws and Cs. There are these particles we met last time, the last couple lectures, the electrons, and the neutrino that we discovered is carrying away the missing energy of beta decay. So, and then there's some heavier partners of neutrinos and so on. Um, there's the huge ups, down, and strange quarks that we met today. There's three heavier quarks, charm bottom, and top. The top was famously discovered at Fermi Lab in, I think, 95. It was the last quark to be found. One of the weird things about the top, the top is a fundamental particle. It is a fundamental particle. The proton is a composite particle made up of many smaller things. The top is 170, 180 times the mass of the proton. Nobody knows why. It's very heavy. Nobody knows why it's so heavy. Um, <coughs> and the, you know, you'll notice there's this other odd thing that these uh, particles come in three families. You know, we had uh, six leptons, and we also had six quarks. Nobody understands this pattern either, why there's, why there's uh, the same number of both. You know, nobody understands why there's uh, three sort of natural generations, these vertical columns. Nobody knows that. And, of course, I left off something very important. I left off the Higgs boson. <laughs> so this picture is complete in itself almost, except, except all these particles are fundamentally massless. But the Higgs boson comes in. The Higgs boson couples to all these guys. Remember, the Higgs boson has this bath that gives mass to everything and tries to move through it. Now, the Higgs boson couples to all these guys and gives them mass. It couples to all the quarks and gives them mass. It couples to the weak, the weak nuclear force would behave a lot like the strong nuclear force. They're very similar if there was no Higgs. But the Higgs boson couples to the W and Z and gets that mass and turns that into the short range nuclear force. And the only honestly massless particles here are the photon, which mediates electromagnetism, and the gluons. And the difference between electromagnetism and uh, the strong nuclear force is that there's one photon, but many gluons. And the, because there's many gluons, they interact in a much uh, different way and display this confining behavior where um, all the color charge is forced to, forced to be uh, neutral. Or, or all the particles that are here for us to be So this Higgs boson is a really important ingredient because it gives mass. You know, it determines which particles get mass, which ones don't. It determines, it, set, it distinguishes the weak nuclear actions from the strong nuclear interactions. It's very important. Um, I already said all this, so I'll just uh, uh, skip that. It's very important. And the second thing we saw from last time is that the standard model has problems with probability without it. If we don't have a Higgs, there's, uh, we can do scattering experiments where the probabilities of the cube just become much larger than one, which makes no sense as a probability, around a tera electron volt, which is a thousand giga electron volts without the Higgs. So if there's nothing below a tera electron volt like the Higgs, then the standard model is just inconsistent as a theory. You start computing probabilities of things happening, you get numbers like 50 instead of 50 percent, and, 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 and it just makes no sense. So this is the energy scale being probed by the LHC, this accelerator in Switzerland. It's what the LHC was built to find, essentially although we hope it finds a lot more. And uh, so now I'll get back to the slides I had last time uh, that I promised you about hunting for the Higgs. Um, 
And uh, uh, this is a picture of the Atlas detector, the CMS detector. So these are two detectors at, the, at CERN that then smash these protons together and look at all these byproducts. Actually, I suppose in the fall, they should really get somebody um, from the CMS group to, 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 to give some detailed lectures about this, because that would be really, that would be really great. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes into these experiments that I don't know about. Um, I did want to point out one thing, how, how liberal some of these people are with uh, their acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I saw this on the wall when I was an undergraduate, because an Atlas group in Michigan. The Atoroidal LHC apparatus, that's kind of, you know, pushing it a little bit. But now that they have their official collaboration <coughs> pictures, they can have pictures of Atlas holding up the world and everything. Which is, I don't know, these guys don't have that. But they're, it's a more plain acronym, the compact you want so on. So what are they doing at the LHC? And here's this picture that I had again, which is now correct, protons coming together and smashing into stuff. Well, they want to make Higgs particles, and there's many ways to make them. And I took this image actually from the website of CDF, which is one of the experiments at, at Fermilab, because so they had a nice picture. Um, the, the most important, well, essentially the most important mechanism is gluon fusion. So in a proton, there's these quarks moving around, but there, there are also gluons in the proton that are holding the quarks together. And so when you smash two protons together, some of the stuff you get comes from quarks hitting quarks, some of it from quarks hitting gluons, some of it from gluons hitting gluons. It's very complicated, it's kind of a mess. Um, but when you have gluons hitting each other, those gluons can make quarks, and one of the quark pairs can annihilate, and the other quark pair is annihilate to make a Higgs boson. And we drew top quarks in here because it's uh, the, the, the contribution from making a top loop is the biggest one. It's the top loop. So the idea is there are many ways to make a Higgs boson, and one of them is by smashing gluons together through some process to make this Higgs. Then that Higgs boson, because it's, the Higgs boson is an unstable particle, it will decay. So you look for the decay products, and then you have to ask, well, what does it decay to? And for the standard model Higgs, that leads to a plot like this, which is very famous. Um, the vertical axis here is the branching ratio. What it says, so each one, okay, so each one of these lines is a decay pattern for the Higgs. So for example, this one, BD bar, this line describes the process of a Higgs decaying to a bottom quark and an anti-bottom quark. And this line describes the process for a Higgs decaying to two W bosons. And what the branching ratio is, is, is the probability you know, the, the relative probability of the Higgs decaying in that way. So, and, and here's the Higgs mass down here, because we don't know what the Higgs mass is. So if the Higgs mass is 100 GV, then with probability very close to one, it's, it's going to want to decay to BD bar. Uh, sometimes it'll decay to two talons, then maybe it'll decay to two gluons, maybe it'll decay to, or even to two charm, or charm, charm, bar, maybe it'll decay to WW, but way down here with probability, you know, almost one in a thousand will decay to two photons. So you can see that, uh, you, okay, you look at this plot and you think, okay, if you're looking for the Higgs, then you're going to look for uh, a lot of bottom quarks, and you're going to look for a lot of W bosons, because most of the Higgs that you make are going to decay in bottom quarks or W bosons. There's a problem in that when you smash stuff together at the LHC, you don't just make Higgses, you make everything you can make. And so the trick is to find some decay pattern for the Higgs uh, that looks different from the decays of everything else you can make. And it turns out that the standard model loves to make BD bar. You, know, you, you look, you, know, you, you know, collide stuff, if there were no Higgs particle, you'd still see BD bars all over the place. So this is actually a very bad channel to look at. There's a lot of other stuff that's not from the Higgs, from other stuff that you made. And it, it turns out the Higgs is really finicky. Um, it turns out that all of these decay patterns have a lot, big standard model backgrounds. And the best, the best place to look is way, way down here at Higgs to Gamma Gamma. So the, the recent excitement about searches comes from the decay of Higgs to Gamma Gamma, which as you can see, over this map, the, the mass range, which is the mass range that people are really focusing on is 100 to 100. 50 GV. Um, this mass range, um, maybe one in 500 Higgs bosons that you make decays this way. So you have to make 500 Higgs bosons just to even have one data point. So that gives you an idea of just how difficult this experiment is. Now let me tell you something else. This whole plot assumes the standard model of particle physics and nothing else. Um, there are models for new physics that include adding a new particle that doesn't carry standard model charge that the Higgs can decay to. There are models like this. And if some model like that is, 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 is describing our world, then the Higgses are all going to decay to that, and we're never going to see it. So this, you know, as you change your model around, as you add new physics beyond the standard model, this, these things can change. And so uh, it, it, it's, it's a very complicated business. Now, I showed this plot last time. I wanted to show it again. This is the data. 
There's a lot of excitement to finding a Higgs at roughly 125 GD. There's some hints of that. So this is the Higgs to gamma gamma signal. This is the number, you know, some uh, normalization of the number of events that they see in this gamma gamma. The, the red line is the background. So the red line is what you would expect if there was no Higgs particle, just the standard model. And all the, the dots are the data points of how many events they actually measure. And this is from Atlas. This is from CMS. And uh, well, I blacked out the axes here because a lot of people know where the 125 GB is. But if you look at the data and ask where's the signal, it's really hard to see. The signal is actually this here. This is what everybody's excited about. This little, and what what makes this different than this? This little bump. It's very, and this is the stronger signal. CMS sees a signal too, and CMS is in here somewhere, um, but very very subtle. And very careful statistics. <coughs> so the 125 GB signal is. Actually, it's uh, yeah. It should be here. This should be. So maybe this is this is slightly moved when I made the plot. 125 GB is roughly here. So you know it's very you know this this by itself is not significant. It's not significant enough. They looked at many other channels, many other sort of decay patterns of the Higgs, and the data is not as good. But if you combine the data, the, the total statistics can give something reasonable. So they produced plots that look like this as the energy range of the Higgs. So these, these bands are telling you about the null assumption. So just assume if there were no Higgs, then they would, so the vertical axis is the, prob the, the, the net probability to make Higgs or whatever, um, divided by what the standard model predicts. So if the standard model Higgs is what we see, there's nothing new, then, then, then it should be here. And the, green, the, the dotted line is, is what they expect to be able to rule out based on their measurements. And these are some deviations based on statistics of what they're expected to rule out by based on their measurements. And so this is what they should be able to rule out if there was no Higgs. And this is an example of what they're able to rule out if there is a Higgs. And you see that uh, the, the, the bump here is the statement that they bring all the channels together, they're seeing something on 125 GB. It's saying that they can rule out a Higgs that has a bigger cross-section than the standard model, but they can't rule out as much as they should have been able to rule out if there was no Higgs. So if they can't rule out as much as they should have been able to rule out if there was no Higgs, it's evidence that there's a Higgs. We're going to probably present the data. The CMS is, 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 sort of, is a similar idea, it's a little bit um, um, fuzzy data. But anyway, this is what's got everybody excited. And we hope that by the summer or the end of this year, there'll be enough data collected in the new run, which is an ATV, not seven, um, to be sure uh, that this pump at 125 is really I didn't put the exclusion plot, but they've been able to, you can see from here, they've been able to exclude the Higgs basically 130 out and uh, 115 down. And up to 114 was already excluded by the previous uh, experiments at CERN, the, the, the LEP experiment. So they're really nailing it down. If this isn't the Higgs, then the Higgs isn't, isn't here at all, probably, because they ruled out basically everything else. And that means that either the Higgs isn't like a standard model Higgs, you need some new physics, like a new particle that it's decaying to, which explains why we don't see it. Or who knows? But if they don't find the Higgs, it's a real big mystery. And the last thing I'll say is everybody expected the Higgs to be here, not here, and that's a big deal. Um, this is actually a, something that's hard to model, though, and people are working very hard on that. So, okay, I have a few minutes left. So, now I'll say a few words about going beyond the standard model, and all of next lecture will be about beyond the standard model, so I'm going to just highlight a couple of things. Um, <clears throat> one thing I wanted to point out is something that I mentioned about uh, the first way you can tell that something has to be something. Um, I said that the electromagnetic interaction at low energies was weak and at high energies was strong. If I follow that logic, then the electric, and unfortunately when people plot, they plot the inverse coupling, they, so they like to plot the inverse interaction. So this is one over the interaction, so the, the, it's large when it's weakly coupled and it's small when it's strongly coupled. So if I follow this out at infinitum, then it means that the electromagnetic interaction becomes infinitely strongly coupled at some finite high energy scale. And that makes no sense. So clearly something has to happen before that. <coughs> These things are called Landau holes. So clearly some new physics has to happen before that. And uh, well, we know that some new physics has to happen at some point, because we know that gravity has to be added to the game, but we haven't added gravity in the standard model yet. This is an excuse for me to point out something else, which is that if you look at how these, these, um, uh, the strengths of these interactions that we study behave as a function of energy scale, we said that they get quantum corrected, so the strength of the interaction depends on the energy scale at which you measure it. And if you look at the, the strength at which they behave, 
these, uh, they, they, they all <coughs> sort of come together at some energy scale up here, I'll tell you the four. <coughs> Um, it's not perfect, it's not great, but they do, they do come close together, and this is a little bit of a hint of some structure up here. Um, but you should not be impressed that two, two of these lines meet at a point, because any two lines in the plane meet at a point. But the fact that three of them, yeah, the fact that three of them are coming together close to a point is kind of impressive. And I'll say more about that in a minute. So, the fact that electromagnetism becomes strongly coupled at high, or high energies uh, is one indication that we need something new. Uh, we know that gra the standard model doesn't have gravity. Some other things the standard model is missing, it doesn't, it doesn't have an intrinsic mechanism for describing neutrino mass. We know the neutrinos are not massless particles, they have mass, and uh, uh, it doesn't have an intrinsic mechanism for describing that, uh, because they don't get a mass from the Higgs boson, just the electrons and so on, at least not on the standard model. Um, so there are, you know, there are models that we, we can incorporate things that introduce neutrino mass. It's not that we don't know how to describe it, but there's no sort of unique way to do it. We don't know which way it's implemented in nature. So that's the question. There are a lot of things you've probably heard about from Mr. Paul about cosmology from Mark that the standard model is missing. Dark matter is not part of the standard model. Dark energy, well, you need the gravity to talk about dark energy. Gravity is not in the standard model. The matter antimatter asymmetry doesn't have a natural explanation that I know of in the standard model. Um, the fact that we see matter in our universe, not antimatter. Why is there so much matter, not antimatter? There are hints of grand unification, which I said on the previous slide, all the coupling constants sort of coming together. And then there's this other thing called the hierarchy problem. And the hierarchy problem, I sometimes call this, and this is, this is a bit of a shock, and it's not quite fair. And I think the hierarchy problem is very important. But it's kind of funny, I think, to, to refer to it as the kind of thing that physicists worry about when they're bored. Um, <laughs> there was a long period of time from the discovery of the W and the Z bosons in the early 80s until now when there really wasn't that much new data coming out of the experiment. I mean, sure, we discovered, we discovered the top core, but it was where we knew it would be. Um, but people looked for all that time for deviations from the standard model, things where the standard model was wrong. And time and time again, it failed. We found, no, the standard model was right. So there were no overarching problems. You have to describe this new physics or that new physics. So you start thinking about sort of more fundamental things like the hierarchy problem. And the hierarchy problem is roughly this. There's a whole bunch of energy scales in nature. And we believe that we should be able to describe physics at all energy scales by some, some theory. Well, there's some energy scale way up here where quantum gravity is sitting, and that's a big mystery. And we're going to spend the second half of the lecture series talking about that. Um, way, way down here is the weak scale, which is the mass of the W and Z bosons, which comes from the Higgs boson. And then below is the proton mass and the electron mass. There is 16 orders of magnitude here. And you know, it's, a, it's an important you know, we have a question of where this scale came from. Now, this scale actually we understand. Why, why this, you know, this scale has to do with the strong interactions of, the, of uh, QCD. I said that uh, QCD becomes stronger and it sort of becomes, uh, 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 it becomes stronger at low energy scales. This is the characteristic energy scale when QCD is becoming very strong. So this, and this is the scale that's generated by the dynamics of QCD. This scale we don't really have an understanding for. Uh, we have no idea where this giant 10 to the 16 factor that separates this, this fundamental scale of gravity from the weak scale comes from. And more technically, what, what's happening, this scale is set by quantum corrections to the Higgs mass, which, which, uh, which are infinite. I have not mentioned yet in these lectures the infinities that, that uh, play quantum field theory and all of these calculations of, uh, of, of particle processing. I'm going to say a lot about infinities in the coming lectures. I really want, you know, if you read some of these, some of these textbooks, there are some of these books on, uh, you talk about infinities and normalization, things getting swept under the rug. It, it, a lot of it's misleading. At least when I was, I haven't read some of these things in many years, but when I was reading these things when I was in, uh, in high school and so on, looking back, a lot of them are just wrong. And, and they don't, you know, so I want to spend a lot of time talking about what these infinite corrections really are, what they mean, and, and how we should interpret them. But for now, I'll just say there are infinities here. There are bad infinities. We introduce some, you know, some technical way to deal with them, but that technical way requires, it doesn't give us a natural understanding of this large scale separation. Um, we say that it's finely tuned. This, this technical way of dealing with these infinities requires us to introduce new, new parameters, and these parameters have to be chosen to within one part, I don't know, 10 minus 12 or something. So one part, you know, they have to be chosen very finely in order to reproduce this, and if they're even a little bit different, then our world looks totally different. 
And if we have a model, if you have a model of, of the world that's described by some parameters, and your model of the world drastically changes when you tweak one of the parameters a little bit, it means your model is not good. It's not capturing the essential physics. It's not capturing the essential features of what you're trying to describe. It's not a robust model. So in some sense, the hierarchy problem is about the fact that our current understanding of particle physics is not robust enough in that sense. So then finally, uh, I'll point out, I have to point this out, because the next lecture on supersymmetry, I, there's this slide in this picture I showed of the, uh, you know, it strikes as the electromagnetic weak and you know, strong interactions coming together being almost the same at some energy scale. If you add my favorite extension of the standard model, which is supersymmetry, this becomes much better. You know, these things sort of come together, but not really, but if you add supersymmetry, they come right together to a point. I mean, it's, it's not completely precise. Obviously, if you zoom in, you'll see something that looks like this, but it's significantly improved. And it suggests that the three forces that we know in nature have a sort of uniform origin at some higher scale. This is called grand unification. It's a beautiful concept. I really like it a lot. And it's, this is one of the sort of compelling hints of supersymmetry. It's one of the reasons people like it. So um, that gives me into the next lecture, when I'll talk more about beyond the standard model physics. I'll say more about infinities in detail and, uh, and talk about supersymmetry. But uh, that's it for today. Uh, I'll put the summary slide about the strong